Well, agriculture is not an industry that for those who are easily discouraged. Uh, they are quite used to, to dealing with adversity and complexity. Uh, it's, it goes on from what John Stone was saying. It's another struggle for survival, but a different kind of struggle. And the nature of the complexity is, is rather different. Uh, although there are elements of, uh, of social conflict that come into some of the things that are causing trouble in agriculture now. I want to just give you a little bit of an overview and then focus on a couple of key risk areas. And in this discussion, I want to talk about public response or institutional response of some sort to the sorts of risk that agriculture is facing rather than the, the billions of individual private responses to risk that uh, farmers make. It's the, the biggest industry in the world. Uh, it's been the biggest industry ever since there were industries. Uh, part of its complexity comes from the fact that there are 2.6 billion individual businesses involved, uh, to some extent interacting with each other. And it's become even more complex, as you'll see as I start talking about the movement of uh, pests around the world, that there are industries other than agriculture that are impinging on agriculture. So it's not just agriculture responding, but other businesses such as transport also have to respond in order to save agriculture. Uh, risks on the whole relate to two issues, production and price. Uh, the key ones, I would say, are, are weather, pests, and markets. By pests, I mean all things that, uh, that affect agriculture, that are, are organisms, so it's not just insects, but it could be birds, pathogens, weeds, etc. There are long and short term components of this, and we'll see some of the distinctions in the risk response to short and long term. Uh, there are natural events, like the weather, of which you don't have very much control, but where you can take some responsive action, even if you can't have controlling action. And then there are others that involve human intervention, and the transport of pests is an example of that, where you can actually try to affect and control the root cause as well as react once something happens. And I want to distinguish between two key types of risk, as I see them, coming back to the taxonomy of risks that we've, we've seen earlier, which is those continuous or uh, single event risks. The continuous ones are things like the weather or uh, the failure of controls against pests, and whereas uh, single event ones would be something like a quarantine failure that changes the nature of nature. So I want to particularly uh, look first at uh, issues to do with, uh, with quarantine failure. And, and we'll come back then to some issues of uh, continuous losses later on. Uh, the scale is, is pretty impressive. Uh, it's been estimated in the US that uh, roughly $137 billion a year is lost from introduced pests. Uh, the most significant individual species is the house cat at over 13 billion a year. Uh, the rat is second and it goes down on and on and on like that. And you can immediately see there are conflicts here. Uh, the public spends in the US uh, something in the order of four billion dollars a year on cat food and yet it's, it's actually the most serious pest. Large number of species that have uh, been introduced into North America since the European colonization. These pests continue to arrive. Uh, they travel both ways. Uh, transatlantic pests are the main pests of Europe in terms of quarantine concern. And increasingly now, we are looking at pests of the natural environment rather than just pests of agriculture. And that's quite interesting because we're using the, the infrastructure of the agricultural industry and the, the protection against movement of pests now to protect the environment uh, and immediate trees, for instance, rather than potato pests. The response to risks can be very, very expensive. Uh, citrus canker in the United States, uh, half a billion dollars has been spent trying to control and to compensate farmers involved in that disease. Uh, ISBM 15 is the international standard for phytosanitary measures that deals with wood packaging material. That costs $2 billion a year to the transport industry to treat with pallets. And we'll see a little bit about why that is here, just like I go into a, an example of that in more detail. 
This has arisen because of the, the great increase in the movement of uh, trade from China into North America and Western Europe in the 90s. And in 1996, the Asian longhorn beetle, a large wood boring beetle, was introduced into both Western Europe and North America on pallets from China, wooden pallets from China. And it's estimated that the losses in North America could be up to 100 billion a year from that single pest. Now, I suspect that initially they would be very high and then they would gradually tail off as trees that were less susceptible to these borers took the place of the original trees. But there was literally the, the prospect of Canada without maples. And so it was, it was not just an economic loss, but uh, that, that kind of um, scale at all. They spent $75 million eradicating it. The eradication was completed in 2005. Prior to the eradication being successful in North America, the US and a number of Western European countries pushed for the, the adoption of this ISBM 15 standard, which would cause the heat treatment or replacement of wooden pallets with, with uh, non-susceptible types of pallet. Now we followed by the Emerald Ash Borer, and we'll come on to the Emerald Ash Borer again in a minute. Note this is a map of downtown Chicago, and it shows the individual trees that were infested in the, the height of the outbreak. Uh, a couple of thousand trees, amenity trees, in the streets in downtown Chicago. And there was a similar outbreak in, in Manhattan as well. Now, the response to this risk has been to tighten up on, on quarantine and to, probably for the first time, really focus on the transport industry as the, the conduit, the, the unexpected conduit of a, a major pest species or group of pest species. Uh, heat treatment, in, in theory, is relatively straightforward. It certainly kills the beetles, uh, which are in the wood that the pallets are made of. The beetles have quite a long life cycle, and so the larvae are in the wood. If it's untreated wood, they can be moved around in six months or so before the beetles emerge when they've got to some other destination. So, yeah, easy in theory, uh, not so easy in practice. Previously, only a couple of percent of the pallets were treated now, uh, two billion new pallets a year have to be heat treated and cost about a dollar each. Alternatively, you can replace them with expensive plastic pallets, but you then have, what do you do with a plastic pallet at the end of its life? With wooden pallets, you can cut them up into mulch and do other things with them. There's a lot on effect to this, though, now. We, there's now a whole industry associated with <coughs> enforcement of heat treatment in pallets. Uh, each heat treated pallet has to have a, a label. Uh, there's a concern now about counterfeit pallets. Uh, if pallets are repaired, the components of repaired pallets must also be heat treated. It's turned the pallet industry from being a pretty simple operation where you have a warehouse with a bunch of pallets and you sell them one kind of pallet, uh, now to pallets that meet the different standards from local transport, international transport, uh, what kind of uh, labels have got, how's that label been validated, and so on. And it really matters because 93% of world trade by value travels on a wooden pallet. So it's really had a, a huge effect that goes just beyond agriculture itself. Now, the age longhorn beetle then is solved, been eradicated, uh, steps to stop the pathway have been uh, put in place, and of course now another wood boring beetle has turned up in North America. Uh, probably the introduction of it before the, the pallet rules changed. So you can't say that it's a failure of the pallet rules. Uh, it's been there, been there for some time. Here's a reaction uh, on the front page of the Chicago Tribune in the middle of last September. Uh, it's a repeat. The attitude is it's a repeat of the, uh, the Asian Long Beetle, which is mentioned here uh, as having been a, a problem in the city in the past. And there are billboards all around the suburbs of Chicago warning people to take action to help eradicate this. So that's the, the reaction locally there. If you look at the bigger picture, this is the map of outbreaks of emerald ash borer. Now, you can see in the, the suburbs of Chicago, uh, this is pretty much on the fringe of this problem. Um, 
people there are looking at this and saying, oh yeah, it's like the age of long people. We're going to eradicate this. It's going to cost a bit of money. We'll lose a few trees. But the same reaction is going to work. Well, quite clearly not. There's not an open hell of eradicating this thing. It's, it's all over these areas. It's uh, over there as far as Maryland. It's spent $50 million so far, and it's going to be a total waste. Um, it is certainly going to spread. So the same reaction is not going to work. Uh, we closed the door already to more of these things, but we're going to have to live with this one. Now, one of the things that's, I think, most difficult in dealing with these single event risks in agriculture is the is understanding and interpreting the data. Uh, there's quite a lot of data, but actually interpreting it is not so easy. What this figure shows, two figures, is from 1900 roughly to 2000, the number of arthropod species, so insects, mites, ticks, things like that, and uh, plants, say plant diseases on the right, uh, per decade. So it's the number of introductions into Europe. And you can see that on the face of it, the problem is getting worse. Uh, it's, it's not actually all that big a run of data. So we're, you know, it's, yes, it's 100 years, but it's, it's not that many cases per year. So it doesn't necessarily tell us what's going on. In fact, you might also say, well, yeah, there's been a whole lot of international action. And in fact, what we're seeing here is the result of all the action that took place in the 1990s, the introduction of unified European quarantine legislation, uh, international standards started in, in the mid-90s. And it's all going to go down like this. And we really just don't know. We're not going to know for another three, four decades at least before we have any really reliable statistics about whether we're winning the battle. And not like wars, maybe where you, you know pretty quickly whether you've won or lost. Uh, with pests, it's not quite so clear. So we don't really know where we're going. A lot of effort goes into trying to quantify the risk. Uh, there is a, another international standard for pest risk analysis that tries to work out ways of quantifying the risk of pests in an agreed, standardized manner so that the response, the rules which are made to regulate the movement of, of goods or services that might affect pests uh, can be seen to be fair as well as effective. It's extremely difficult to do this. Uh, it's not like, say, in fisheries policy, fisheries regulation, where what you're trying to achieve is, is good catch per effort data. Uh, you know, how many fishing boats have gone out, you know what they're for, and if it doesn't match up, then you change the licensing. With agricultural pests, the numbers are not always what they seem. First of all, the interception data, the key data that we've got, what do inspectors find at ports, is after a lot of intervention has taken place. So people have tried to clean up what they're shipping, and we're only catching some unknown proportion of what is left over. So we don't really know what the, the real challenge is. The result, though, is that in the US, for which we have the best data, uh, something like 25,000 pest interceptions per year. Uh, one of the reasons we have this data in the U.S. is that the inspections are at the port of entry. In Britain, the inspections are at the, port of, at the point of delivery. So we don't actually know what comes in at Heathrow. We know what ends up causing a problem at a supermarket or a nursery. It's a completely different approach. And the, the data is, to some extent, worth less in Britain as opposed to worthless. Um, the biggest problem is in baggage. Uh, Six percent of people's baggage has got something in it that is of concern to a quarantine inspector. It doesn't necessarily mean it's got a, an insect or a disease, but it may have a, a healthy fruit, which is just as much of a, a problem as an unhealthy one. Now, 6% translates into around 70 million pieces of baggage worldwide. So it's a, it's a complex problem to inspectors. Uh, a number of airports around the world now have 100% x-ray of, of baggage as it goes through. Cargo, interestingly, uh, in fact, is actually much less a problem. Uh, roughly one interception per $3 million worth of goods, uh, fruit and vegetables, uh, in this case, coming into the US. But it's highly skewed. 
There are some very, very clean products, for instance, Chilean grapes, $600 million worth of Chilean grapes went into the United States in 2005, not a single interception. So it's, uh, there are some things that are coming in quite dirty and other things in massive amounts that are very, very clean. 4% uh, of international post contains something of a, a quarantine concern. Uh, in terms of meat uh, products, uh, think about foot and mouth disease or, or BSC in Britain. After the, the FMD outbreak, they found uh, through spot surveys that people are smuggling something like 7,500 tons of meat into the United Kingdom in luggage and post, uh, illegal meat. Uh, the majority of it, uh, wild meat from Africa and Asia. In New Zealand, uh, roughly one person per jumbo jet is fined for bringing in some quarantine material. And we're really faced with a challenge of how to measure what's going on. And it's, <clears throat> it's, it's very, very much more difficult than it imagines. If you look at uh, effort, uh, even saying, well, has the number of quarantine inspectors changed? Well, roughly it hasn't in the US. There are more or less the same number, but the quality you know, what are they actually doing every day is, is changing. Uh, some of them transfer to looking for explosives, they're looking for drugs, they're looking for lots of things. And the direction of the effort, even though you know the numbers, changes from day to day and year to year. Here are figures showing from 1990 to 2005, the inception in the blue one is baggage at US airports and ports. And the darker line there is cargo, and then there's a very, very small line of things in the mail. Uh, very too, far too little is done in the mail. Uh, you see there's a sort of cycle in, in baggage inspection. Uh, everything is going along okay, and a crisis develops, and they increase the effort again. So interpreting these figures tells you as much about reaction to the problem as the challenge. Uh, the, the other line, the, the cargo one, that actually reflects more accurately the rise in the value of, and volume of fruits and vegetables that have been sent into the country over that 15 year period. Here's the rise of, of fruit and vegetable <coughs> imports. And you can see that uh, since the mid 90s, it's pretty much doubled, and the number of tests that are accepted has roughly doubled as well. So, in that sense, the uh, what we catch probably does reflect the challenge. Now, the size of the figures here seems to have gone awry. Uh, but what this is trying to show, I've, I've looked at individual ports, and what this illustrates is the importance, the qualitative difference of individual inspectors. Uh, there were 36 inspectors in Laredo, Texas, which is the biggest entry point for inspections in the US up to 2003, and they were catching around 1,500 to 2,000 things a year. And in 2004, they cut the number of inspectors to 30 and then down to 27, but there was an 80% reduction in the, in the catch rate of the radio. And in fact, that came because of the retirement of one individual inspector. There was one inspector who up to 2003 accounted for 80% of all of the interceptions in the radio. And he just, you know, had his eye in and he could really spot what was there. And when you look at the distribution of catch rates for inspectors across the whole of the US quarantine service, it ranges from the ones to 1,800 or so a year for an individual. So massive difference in, in the success rate of, of different individuals. I want to come on now to talk a bit about um, continuous risks and the, the reaction to that. And there's a, a number of issues that uh, need to be looked at here, particularly in relation to insurance. Um, uh, at an institutional level, crop insurance is the main reaction to, to these sorts of risks. So there are issues that are, are common to all risk analyses. And um, probably the one that might be a little bit different in this case is uh, compensatory factors. The fact that there is natural variation from area to area, for instance, that the, the environmental interactions might be such that uh, pest or weather problems would be better or worse. But there's a, 
there are a number of different kinds of insurance schemes, and I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, Israeli Citrus Marketing Board <coughs> runs one. They've got a centralized program for controlling fruit flies. Uh, they, they have a levy on growers that pays for this, and what they insure against is the failure of control in individual cases. Not the failure of control overall, but if a particular farmer loses more than a predetermined amount from fruit fly damage, despite the control that the citrus board puts in, then insurance pays for compensation or for extra costs associated with beefing up the, the control. So it's, um, it's an unrestricted insurance, but what happens is that at the end of each year, the, the program is, is adjusted based on performance and the levy rate changes, premium changes, and what it effect, you know, in effect does is creates a, a sort of overdraft facility for a year so that any loss over one year then is reflected in the new rates and the new levies the following year. So it's simply an insurance company mediated overdraft for the citrus board. And there's no <coughs> long term adjustment of risk. It's all, all done on an annual basis. A very large agricultural insurance scheme is the U.S. All Risk Farm Insurance Program, uh, proposed by Benjamin Franklin in 1788. It was actually introduced uh, in the 1930s in the Depression. It uh, covers a whole range of uh, perils. Uh, it's run by the government's Risk Management Agency, which operates in the Department of Agriculture. Uh, what it does is underwrites private insurers to deliver insurance to farmers. So the government, through the USDA, acts as the, the insurer of last resort, it reinsures all of the private insurers. 1.2 million policies, 10,000 loss adjusters around the country. Now, there is excellent actuarial data for this. It goes back decades. Every farmer has to file a return. There are individual farm records, county records, state records, a uh, very good actuarial basis for this. And also the, the control practices with the pests that it covers are also very well described. And there's pretty big, pretty big uptake. What's interesting about this figure here, though, is that the, the higher capacity uh, values here are over $10 million of indemnity covered per county. So you can see that there's a, really a band here and a couple of places in the south that are particularly prone to taking up this insurance, and it's the typical problem of, of insurance that the people with the highest risks are the ones who want to buy it. So people suffering from drought risk in, in the uh, Great Plains, and from hurricane risk on the South Texas coast, and <coughs> Florida are the ones who want to buy this insurance most. So that's uh, a bit of a problem for ensuring that um, the risk is distributed sufficiently. It works pretty well because um, the, the losses uh, are not very long term. We'll, we'll see a slide of that in, in a minute. The kind of scheme involves uh, taking a percentage which the farmer specifies of his recent yield and he protects up to uh, whatever level he wants. And the, the, the higher the level you specify, the higher the premium. You can choose to set your loss against your own farm records or county, but uh, if you do it against your own farm records, the, the uncertainty is greater and therefore the premium is higher. Whereas if you go against the, the county group, then you get a, a discount. Uh, some schemes in some areas are compulsory. For instance, where there are area-wide pest control schemes, you have to join in, and this is done on the basis of a, a vote across the county county votes, everybody's in and has a levy. And it involves a, a combination of government growers and private insurers. So again, the social complexity and the issues and objectives of different groups come in and play a part. It's, it's kind of like a betting agency in a way. You can, you can pretty much bet on anything in agriculture. Uh, you can have production, so you can have a policy that's against the level of production, measured against past performance. You could do that as a group or an individual, or the so-called dollar plan, where you bet on your income, because your income is going to be a product of price and production. 
your production might go down, but your price goes up, or vice versa. And there's a certain amount of inbuilt uh, stability in the system that helps to ensure you. And there's finally a, a catastrophic cover, which is a, a last resort one that um, may bear you out. Now, as I say, one of the reasons this works, and I'll contrast this eventually at the end of this talk with fisheries, is that, first of all, we're on a relatively upward line. This is uh, maize yields, and I've chosen maize as an example of an important crop. Uh, you get a lot of variation, and you can see the variation is actually getting worse, and maybe this is related to climate, uh, crops under stress, and so on. But none of the, the catastrophes are very long-lived. Uh, two, two, three years at the most. We had some very long catastrophes back in the 1930s, which is what prompted the multi peril insurance in the first place. So, it doesn't last very long, which means that insurance can recover. And the yield change affects the price change. And so, in fact, in each of those downward spikes over the last 10, 15 years, there's been an upward spike of price, which is to some extent mitigated the dollar effect on farms. So, you go down, price goes up, and it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be. Are those inflation adjusted? Uh, no, this is the, um, the price. So, yes, you, it's, it's a down, it's a declining industry, that's for sure. So, think about what happens in quarantine failure. Uh, we don't have good actuarial data because by the nature of quarantine, we're talking about a new event, something that for the most part hasn't happened before. Uh, we don't know what to do about the problem. And in fact, one of the things I think that's interesting now is that a lot of quarantine action is actually highly successful and when it's targeted against things that you're planning for. And what we're seeing now is that most of the sort of the big pest problems that are coming are the things we didn't plan for. They're the unexpected unknowns, as, as Rumsfeld would have put it. Priority tends to be set against the magnitude of loss rather than the expectation of loss, simply because you don't know what the expectation is. It's too hard to, to guess. Uh, there are pooled response agreements, and I'll show you an example of one in a moment. And there's a big issue about compensation. Uh, in fact, DEFRA here in the UK is at the moment debating the issue of compensation because traditionally there's been compensation for livestock disease, so no, no, no problem when the mouth came along, there were big compensation payments. But for plant pests, generally there is not compensation paid in the UK. And naturally people are asking, well, what's the difference and why? A uh, big issue about compensation is, of course, the moral hazard one that you don't want to encourage people to to introduce exotic pests. One of the ways the moral hazard issue is dealt with is uh, an example like the, uh, the American Interstate Pest Control Compact, which the states in green all belong to. And what this involves is the state governments contracting with each other as a sort of insurance pool against exotic pest attack. And what they aim to do is to maintain a fund of a million dollars, give or take a few, that's available for any state to draw on if they perceive a problem from an exotic pest that might be affecting them. And the one catch is they can't spend, apply to spend the money in their own state. So, for instance, Arkansas could apply to control pests in Missouri if they felt that Missouri wasn't going to do enough to protect Arkansas agriculture. So it's, it's quite nice, which brings in uh, the externality issue that I, as someone from outside an area where a new pest is, has become a problem, can get involved, uh, but it doesn't have the moral hazard problem. And in fact, there have been relatively few claims on this since it was set up in 1969. <clears throat> the, the recent concern about security has got people thinking about the criteria for bioterrorism, and this is in fact a sort of quarantine turned backwards, and what would be the worst quarantine pest to some extent is the best bioterrorism target. And animal diseases are obviously the most significant in this area, so something like anthrax especially that, that will attack humans is um, a significant threat. Plant pests, uh, really there are very, very few 
Um, there's uh, no indication that there have been even any attempts recently to uh, have bioterrorism using plant pathogens or plant diseases, plant insects. Uh, quite a lot of plant pests are actually moved by the military. Uh, the Colorado beetle probably came into Europe in the First World War with military movements. Uh, the corn borer in the Balkans in the 90s for military movements. Uh, Japanese beetle in uh, the Azores because of military movements from the US. So uh, there are quite a number of cases in Africa from the French Air Force, but not just the US. There have been attempts to try and uh, come up with common scales, and this has been one of the issues that uh, has perplexed uh, quarantine agencies. They tended to use different approaches to different kinds of pests. Uh, one of the responses has been one that DEFRA is now using called the Non-Native Species Risk Assessment Scheme, which takes all non-native species, whatever they are, and uses a common risk assessment format. And it's based on a, a system that's used by the Environmental Risk Management Agency in New Zealand. What it does is set common scores for frequency, so we have standardized definitions on a log scale so that you can, you can uh, add risks. Um, and this is gone miniature in transmission. Um, the idea here is that the description of impacts is also on a standardized scale. And it's in different dimensions. So we've got monetary losses, health impacts, environmental impacts, and social impacts uh, with a description, a verbal or a, a description of words of common standards so that a scale of three means the same roughly in different dimensions. This is in an attempt to say, allow you to measure the impacts of crustacea in rivers and diseases of oak trees or uh, a pathogen of uh, potatoes all on the same scale. Here's one of the figures so that you can read it. Uh, Set different scales for different pests. I just want to end by talking a little bit about how we're applying some of these concepts to uh, another area of agriculture, as some people see it, as fisheries. Uh, we have uh, in the college uh, a project, a European Commission project called PRONE, with partners around Europe looking at uh, insurance in fisheries and trying to think about how such a, a program might be designed. Uh, there's two parties, uh, the industry and the regulator, both of whom share responsibility. And there's a principal beneficiary, which is the industry. The regulator doesn't really benefit very much. The two big variables in the scheme are uh, the accepted fishing effort that the industry will put up with. So the, the European Commission establishes a uh, target, and the industry says, OK, well, we'll, we'll work towards that catch target. And then the regulators agree to a particular level of enforcement that target. So that's where the responsibility lies. So the idea would be that um, if the fishing industry accepts a lower target and the regulators accept a higher level of enforcement, then the premiums that arguably both might pay to protect the industry from collapse would be lower. Whereas if you put it under stress, you have a higher target and lower enforcement, then you will pay higher levels. Now, the problem here is that unlike agriculture uh, on land, uh, aquaculture or fishing is a, is a really a declining industry. This is uh, cod landings, and this is not really an insurance problem, it's, it's a problem of certainty. This stock is going to collapse. And so, you know, that is, I think, the thing that's going to countervail against any insurance scheme as a, as a result. If we know it's going to collapse, then what are people going to do? Well, say the higher the enforcement level or the lower the catch level, the higher your, uh, sorry, the lower your premium would be. We could insure against two things, and, and maybe what we ought to be thinking about is not so much insuring cod, but uh, insuring some other fishery that is not quite so near to collapse. And to think about two kinds of insurance. One is uh, collapse insurance completely. So I mean, what would we do if whole industry falls apart, or uh, something that's a bit more responsive, which is a catch for effort 
insurance, where it's, it's much more marginal and it's much more continuous, and it allows, through an adjustment, a frequent adjustment of premiums, immediate feedback, which you could do almost daily, as catches are totted up and, and computerized, that the, the rate would change and uh, insurance would be built into the license charge and it would feed back into whether it was worth taking the boat out the next day. And that would actually allow quicker response. So I think what to insure uh, is important to think about what's the actual nub of this problem and how can we resolve the problem and maintain the stock as opposed to resolving the problem by paying off fishermen So it was simply a transfer of, of the risk from the insurance companies to the government in that case. Uh, I agree that it's, uh, it's not fair, and the insurance companies got off pretty well. The, the, the farmers thing, didn't. They, they, they got their compensation. Yeah, the other thing, I have a cousin who's a dairy farmer, uh, and has been affected by the TV. Mm. Um, and there's this great issue about um, whether one should exterminate badgers in the facility. Are there um, areas of this where data is what might be ideologically affected because people actually don't want to admit that certain data might be uh, the case? Yeah, the badger case is an interesting one there. It's alleged that uh, badgers transmit tuberculosis to cattle and that therefore if you exterminate it, badgers in an area, it would reduce the, the rate of transmission. And there have been some quite large-scale experiments that have tried to demonstrate that uh, badgers are, are transmitting them. And they've been inconclusive as far as many scientists see it. And what is clear is that badgers get tuberculosis and that tuberculosis is a highly transmissible disease. So that, in fact, anything that gets tuberculosis uh, is likely to transmit it to something else. The question is whether the badgers are, not that they can transmit it, but whether they're a major source of transmission. And yes, it's a big problem because the scale of experiment that's needed to prove it is really quite large and becomes almost a control program in itself. Uh, badgers are seen as victims of persecution. Uh, in theory, nice furry animals, and people don't want to see them branded. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a lot of people who have got the answer before they've done the experiments, and the experiments would be very, very difficult. But are, are there other instances of that? Elsewhere? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, many, many of them. Uh, almost all of these cases of, of things like Asian Long or Beetle or the Animal Dashboard, you have no idea how they're going to spread or how successful the control measures will be when you start taking them. You have no idea how accurate the detection system is. So you have a map of downtown Chicago that shows you every infested tree. It's every infested tree you know about. It doesn't tell you anything about the ones you don't know about. And so there's an awful lot of seat in the pants uh, response to risks once to happen. You have to act quickly. There are relatively standard approaches you take, and you hope they work most of the time. Seat in pants response. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, do, 
had them to know whether uh, under which conditions uh, the uh, assessment of risk by the insurers will support or destroy self <coughs> uh solutions of farmers. Uh, well, they will support farmers to find their own solutions <coughs> to prevent problems. Well, to some extent it does, because, for instance, the all risk insurance in the US requires farmers to take action against certain pests which are known to be a problem. So, in that sense, it encourages them to take action to prevent the problem. On the other hand, it's a drought insurance. It encourages farmers to plant wheat or maize in drought susceptible areas. Uh, you might argue that for broader social goals of water management, that you might not want wheat across the, the central Great Plains. It might be better to have uh, grazing, for instance, for water management. So there is certainly a conflict in society between those two objectives, and the insurance scheme definitely pushes one. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the compensation for citrus canker in Florida promotes uh, a citrus industry that is, to, to a large extent, uneconomic and operating against the the land use plans of large numbers of people in the state. But half a billion dollars has gone into prop it up. <coughs> I think largely for political reasons. <coughs> <coughs>